This is the second in a series of videos all about how I built Lumineer, the most recent high power rocket that I flew. And specifically this video is talking about the fin setup on the vehicle. These might seem like a pretty simple set of fins. It's just four fins, how hard could it be? Uh, pretty hard actually. As it turns out, this was the most complicated part of the build, which is why today's video is a little bit longer. I've mentioned it before, but I want to do a space shot, a rocket that goes above 100 kilometers. And if I'm going to do that, I'm gonna to have to learn how to do composite builds. I've never done that before, and this felt like a great opportunity for me to learn. Starting with the base of the fins, I opted for using G10 quarter inch thick fiberglass. Then on top of that, the fins are laid up with fiberglass cloth that is laid up in a tip to tip configuration. And we'll talk about what that means a little later on. Now, because I've never done composites before, we actually built two fins cans, one as a backup and then one that was intended for flight. This is the backup and it never fully got finished, but the idea was that if I mess something up on one, um, I would have a backup so that I could meet my launch date. The other reason it was a good idea for me to separate out the fin can from the booster instead of attaching them directly to the booster is, you know, not that anything bad would ever happen to this fin can or especially that anything bad would ever happen to the booster, that definitely wouldn't happen at all. But just in case, I can reuse these fins on a new vehicle now without having to lay up a new booster. I started from totally bare sheets of G10 fiberglass and then used the CAD file to trace out the fin shapes I wanted. I think a bandsaw would have been the better tool to use here to cut these fins out, but it doesn't really matter because in cutting the shapes out, I intentionally got a little bit sloppy in the don't cut quite enough off direction, if that makes sense. The most important thing at this point isn't that the fins match the CAD, it's that they match each other. Once I had finished cutting them all out, I clamped them together and hit the belt sander. We had plenty of stability margin here, so even if I have to take off a centimeter in one direction or another, it was more important to me that the fins were identical in size to each other. With the shape cut out, I also needed to chamfer the leading and trailing edges. For this, honestly, I just got one fin to the point where it looked kind of right and based the other three fins off of it. Are there ways to properly size your chamfers for leading and trailing edges? Yes. Will they make or break this flight? Absolutely not. So now the big question is, how do you get these fins stuck onto the rocket? That's the billion, million, it's not that much money. I don't know, this is like the thousand dollar question. Well, the name of the game with a fin can like this is patience, forethought, a really good respirator, and then sanding, and then also sanding. And additionally, on top of that, sanding. I started by epoxying the root face of the fin directly to the fin can. But you can't just wing it on stuff like this and like pun sort of intended. <laughs> what I did to line these fins up is build a sort of fin jig out of eight different 3D printed pieces. The pieces are connected together in two ways. One with a half inch rod and then two they connect to each other. And you can already sort of see how this profile works out once the fin sections are connected. The jig is far from perfect, but it totally worked for what I needed. Continuing in a theme from the last video, a lot of the decisions that were made here were made because I had very little time to get everything done and I just needed something that I knew would work well enough. It's important to put thought into how straight your fins are, not just for pitch and yaw reasons, but because we have a reaction wheel on Lumineer to try and control the roll axis, any misalignment that we have in the cant or the sort of roll degree of the fins any misalignment there is going to make the reaction wheel's job harder. Hey Joe, what does a small misalignment look like on the fins? I bet it's not that bad. No, it is that bad. As it turns out, when you go Mach 1.6, it's that bad. Wow, look at this really cool open rocket simulation of Lumineer. Wow, isn't it so cool that we can take the fin cant and set it to 0 0.2 degrees. 0 0.2 degrees, that's like nothing. That is imperceptible. Wow, I wonder what happens if we plot our roll rate with that 0.2 degree misalignment. Oh. Well, that's fun. It's only 1200 degrees per second. That's so fast for no misalignment. That is why it's so important that we get these fins as straight as possible because just with like a tiny, tiny error, 
we're going up to like four hertz, if not higher, uh, in terms of roll rate. It's wild. Okay, I need to calm down a little bit, but basically we want these fins on very straight. Once I extracted the fins from the jig, I set them up with a laser level to get an idea of how straight they were. This method has a lot of flaws on it, and while I tried to account for the flatness of the floor, the flatness of the vehicle, all of the little misalignments I could think of, Mostly the goal was to check like, hey, are they two degrees out of misalignment or are they something on the order of like 0.5 or 0.1? Um, and we got like pretty close to straight on these fins. The next step is to fillet the fins as you would a nice piece of salmon. I'm kidding, you wanna fillet the fins. Um, people get like hilariously mad when you use that word the wrong way. Either way, the fillet is a slug of epoxy that runs along the root cord of the fin and provides a ton of torque strength by increasing the surface area of the epoxy that is both on the airframe and on the fin. While larger fillets do increase drag, I wanted to overbuild this fin can because I didn't have a lot of confidence in a number of aspects of this build. I modeled up a filleting tool in CAD using a 1.2 inch radius around the airframe and fin. And before epoxying, I did a ton of surface prep to ensure a good bond. We'll talk more about surface prep later on, but the gist of it is that I used a bunch of four to 600 grit sandpaper, a bunch of acetone and a number of lint-free wipes. For the epoxy, I'm using Loctite High Sol on the fillets, um, which is a great brand of epoxy to use for this. A, because it's very thick, it's very viscous, so it will retain its shape well, and B, because it's really good in shear stress. For each fillet, I laid down strips of tape to prevent the epoxy from getting where it shouldn't. Epoxy will get everywhere that it shouldn't if you don't do this. I also took great care to minimize or completely eliminate bubbles from the epoxy. A void in the epoxy is pretty bad. It not only decreases the strength of the bond, but it can ruin the surface smoothness of the fillet as well, which is going to be a problem down the road when we try to put fiberglass layups on it. The thing that took the longest here wasn't necessarily the filleting process, but waiting for the epoxy to fully or partially cure before I felt comfortable enough to turn the fin can over and work on another side. Now I 0%, this number, 0% recommend that you do this, but it did work for me. I got away with it. I'm pretty sure you could cause a wonderful little fire with this, but I used a meat thermometer, a cardboard box, and a hair dryer and made the world's most dangerous cure oven. The epoxy cure process is greatly accelerated by the addition of heat, and so this reduced the cure time of the epoxy down from something like 24 to 72 hours down to like two which is amazing. That can let me get multiple fillets done in a day where I would have had to wait and do it over the course of a week. Anyway, again, I don't recommend that you do this. It did work for me. The other thing that I did is I sat next to that stupid little cure oven in my garage with a fire extinguisher right by me and watched it for the full two hour process on each cure. Okay, safety disclaimer out of the way. Please don't do that. Oh my God, please don't do that. And if you do, don't show me. So with the fillets done, the next thing to do is the fiberglass layup. First, I wanna talk about how composite materials work, why they work, and I also wanna preface this by saying, I'll say this multiple times, I am not an expert. I am a dude who got lucky with a YouTube channel who like continues to somehow figure things out. I learned all of these things from friends, word of mouth, internet forums, trying to read papers, but not having a super good background in chemistry. So you should take all of my advice with a grain of salt. Some of it might be dubious, um, but that's kind of the run of the mill for the internet, so. I don't know, your mileage may vary. The point of a composite material is to get the benefits of the materials that are going into the composite. That might be obvious, but usually these materials have different strengths and usually those strengths are complementary. One material might be excellent at resisting compression while the other material might be excellent at resisting tension. And of course you can see where this is going. When you combine them, ideally they create one material that is great at doing both of those things with neither of the drawbacks of each individual material. The problem, of course, is that we live in the real world and it is not easy to combine these two ideally. The drawbacks of one of the materials might lead to the separation of both of the materials and at that point you just have two separate materials again and neither are good at doing what they need to do together. In the case of the fins we're building, the two materials we'll need are fiberglass cloth and then laminating epoxy. The fiberglass is a weave of material which is excellent at resisting tension but not great at compression. I mean, it pretty much just folds. Because it's a weave though, it can resist this tension in just two directions, this and then orthogonal to that direction or 90 degrees to it. Basically what I'm saying is that if I pull here, 
That's not good. It can't resist tension in that direction. But what if we had two layers of fiberglass on top of each other that were clocked a little differently? At that point, you can resist tension in eight directions. And if you do this long enough, you have fiberglass that can resist tension in any direction. The other material in the composite will be the laminating epoxy that I mentioned, which is amazing at resisting force in compression, but it's not good at tension. And I don't know, maybe you're not following along, but just in case. So the fiberglass is great at tension. The epoxy is great at compression. When you combine them, they become best friends and everything works always. This part is important here. When you combine these two materials, you wanna do so so there is just enough epoxy in there to hold stuff together and no extra. There are a number of resources online that gloss over this, pun intended, but when you add too much epoxy, you are not increasing the strength of the layup. You are actually, you are like actively decreasing the strength of your composite material when you add too much epoxy. If you have too much epoxy, the materials aren't working together anymore and the epoxy will be the first thing that takes the load in your structure. And if that structure is experiencing tension, because that epoxy is taking all of the load, it's going to fracture. And at that point, you've compromised your entire composite material. Again, I'll say that I'm not an expert and this is sort of anecdotal. What I found to work pretty well is a ratio of one to one by weight cloth and epoxy. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's cut some fiberglass cloth. The technique that we're gonna use here is super common in rocketry. And as I mentioned before, it's called tip to tip layup. The reason it's called that is because we use one layer of fiberglass that goes from the tip of one fin all the way over here to the tip of another fin. So it's tip to tip. The thing though, is that we're actually going to use more than one layer of fiberglass here. So we have one final layer on top that is truly tip to tip, but lots of layers underneath that you can almost see here that sort of get a little smaller every time you go towards the airframe. Something we need to make here just to get started is called a layup schedule. This is a reference that'll help us cut out the right pieces and shapes of fiberglass in the right order. We'll start by notating the number of layers we need. Honestly, what I did here is just ask a friend. My good friend, Charlie Garcia, has tons of experience with high-powered rocketry. He recommended that I go with a seven-layer layup, stating that it was completely overkill but even if it was just the epoxy holding the layup together at that point, if I didn't have you know, good technique doing this, it should still be okay. So I did seven layers. Then I chose the weave orientation, which is zero and 45 degrees, which means that every layer alternates with a weave direction of zero or 45 degrees. Last, we need to set a first and final orientation. I set these both as zero and we can do that because we have an odd number of layers. Now you can generate fiberglass layup shapes or basically the layer shapes from CAD. I have the CAD model of the vehicle. We could generate those. But much like the airframe video, I chose not to because I knew I could do it by hand a lot faster than teaching myself to do it in CAD. And because of the accelerated build schedule on this vehicle, I felt like, you know what? It's probably not worth doing. There are a lot of ways to do this, but generally speaking, I spaced out each layer about 0.75 inches apart in size. The key is that we should have just one edge exposed at the end of the layup. That's gonna be the piece of fiberglass that goes along the leading and trailing edge of the fin. And then all of the other edge, all of the other sort of laminating points or the, the places where the fiberglass could rip off are covered by that top layer. That's the important part. The other super important thing that I did is to number the layers, it is stunningly easy to lose track of what size and what orientation each layer is. With that done, I traced out all the layers onto fiberglass cloth in Sharpie and then cut them out for all four sets of layups on the fin can. I'm using 7.5 ounce weight fiberglass cloth for most of the structural layers. Um, after the seventh layer of this, I will add an eighth layer of two ounce fiberglass cloth, which is almost entirely cosmetic. It's a lot smoother and will help the aerodynamics of the vehicle, even though it's going to take pretty much none of the load. And then finally, on top of that, we'll have a layer of peel ply to help even further smooth out the surface finish. The other thing that peel ply does great is absorb just a little bit of epoxy so that we can make sure we're not overloading the layup in epoxy. For the final layers, I cut them a little too large on purpose. I wanna let the cloth hang over the edge of the fin rather than falling short. I would much rather sand off the excess cloth at the end than compromise the strength of the layup by accidentally cutting something that's just a little too small. The last thing to talk about here before we do the layup is surface preparation. And oh boy, is there a lot to talk about? And oh boy, do I not know what I'm talking about. The epoxy is going to soak clean through the fiberglass weave to create strength. And like that's all well and good, but none of that will ever matter if we don't have a really solid bond to the vehicle itself. So I'm talking about the fiberglass airframe and the fiberglass fin base. We need to be, <laughs> the fiberglass layup and this need to be absolute best friends. 
forever. Basically, if the adhesion of the layup to the rocket isn't good, we might as well have no layup at all. So this is the first thing to get right, is the attachment to the vehicle and surface preparation is how you get a good bond there. Now, typically, the advice for epoxy bonds or like surface adhesion is to get a low grit piece of sandpaper and rough up the crap out of it so that you're getting lots of grooves in the material. And the thought process is like, okay, if you can create lots of grooves, you get a file in there, rough up the surface, you can create a good mechanical bond at this low surface level. Is that wrong? No. But what's gonna be better for us is if we create a chemical bond at the atomic level. We want something that is like at the base, at the heart of the friendship between these two materials, these things are just bonded for life. Chemically, like chemically, all the way. I am not a chemist. I am not a composites expert. I am a dude on the internet, as I said before. I will link uh, a few different resources below on how exactly this works, and then I will try to ultra TLDR it right here. Essentially, when we do surface preparation, what we're trying to do is create open hydrogen groups that are attractive for materials to bond to. We're also trying as hard as we can to reduce the surface tension so that we sort of promote the distribution of whatever liquid gets onto the surface. And we're gonna do that by stripping away the oxide layer on the top of the material through the use of sandpaper, acetone, and again, lint-free wipes. You can't use paper towels for this. You want to leave like no trace. So they have to be lint-free wipes. Through all of these methods, we're gonna get as much epoxy on the surface of the material as we possibly can. And it's a little counterintuitive, but you will actually get more surface area if you use a finer grit, a higher grit sandpaper total than you would if you were just roughing up the surface mechanically. And this chemical bond, once again, is gonna do so much more for you than that mechanical one where you rough up the surface ever will. For surface prep, what I did is use rigorous amounts of sanding with clean sandpaper that was between four and 600 grit. I then wiped away with acetone. And usually for each surface, I had to do this five or six times before I started getting good results on something called a water break test which is how we're gonna check to see if we're doing a good job on the surface preparation. It's not like we can practically inspect the surface with the tools we have to see, is this surface ready to bond with some epoxy? So a water break test is sort of a good litmus test to see, hey, is this surface attractive to bond to? I don't have a ton of good footage of it, but essentially here's how it works. When the surface has those open hydrogen groups and low surface tension, when we pour some water on it, the water and the surface should become best friends. And we will see evidence of this by the water spreading out as far as it can rather than beading up. When I pour the water on the surface without preparation, it beads up like this, and that's no good. We have what's called a high break angle, something close to 90 degrees here. And what we want is a low break angle, which looks like this. The low break angle indicates that the water is spreading out as much as possible along the surface because of those free hydrogen groups and because of the low surface tension. Again, I am not a chemist. I am not a composites expert. You should take all of the things that I say with a grain of salt and then check out the resources in the description. But essentially what's happening is we pour the water on and the water to anthropomorphize it is very attracted to the surface and spreads out as far as it possibly can. This is a real thing, by the way. Large aerospace companies that do composites have acceptable break angles for different qualities of parts that they build. Once this water break test is passed, I'll dry it up again with lint-free wipes, then I'll give it one more pass of sandpaper and acetone before we're ready to go. The other thing to mention here is that when we do this surface preparation, we wanna do it as close as possible to the actual epoxying process process as we can. We're removing that oxide layer, which is going to slowly come back to the material over time. And in addition, we could have things like dust or lint or who knows what get on the surface and start to compromise the strength of that bond. So between the points of surface preparation and the actual application of the epoxy, I tried to do that no more than 15 to 30 minutes apart. And between those two events, I also use saran wrap to cover the fin can so no dust could get on top. Okay, so the surface is prepared, the cloth is cut, and we are finally ready to do this layup. For the epoxy, I'm using fiberglass System 2000 laminating epoxy resin with the 2060 hardener. 
The 60 in the number indicates that the epoxy is going to cure after 60 minutes of mixing and working with it. Basically, we have about an hour of time to work with this epoxy before we have to let it sit still and then cure. Before any epoxy operation, I lay down a sheet of mylar film on the surface of wherever I'm working. We're gonna get tons of epoxy all over the place whether we want to or not, and so the mylar is gonna help with the cleanup process. I'll also mention that if you're doing this for the first time, I think it's a great idea to try and practice on some low stakes objects for layups before you move to something like a fin can, where if you mess it up, it's gonna be a little bit more expensive to fix. I tried doing layups on several different pieces to get a feel for the process and schedule of the whole ordeal. The thing is, once that epoxy is mixed, you have one hour to get things right or completely mess them up. As mentioned before, when we're measuring out how much epoxy we need, we want about a one-to-one -one ratio of weight between the fiberglass cloth and the epoxy itself. Then for the epoxy itself, the ratio between the epoxy resin and the hardener is three to one. For instance, since if the cloth is 100 grams, we need 100 grams of epoxy and hardener together, which means we need 75 grams of epoxy and 25 of hardener. I usually mix these two together thoroughly for a few minutes and generally a lot longer than it feels like I should intuitively. An insufficient mix is going to compromise the strength of the entire fin can, so better to spend an extra few minutes just going overkill. We'll start with layer one here, setting it on the mylar surface. What we're gonna do is sometimes called pre-preg, and we're basically infusing the epoxy resin into the material. And we're doing this before we apply it to the surface of whatever we're laying up, because doing it this way will let us squeegee out that excess epoxy that we're not gonna need later on, and it's gonna be a lot easier if we're doing it on a flat surface rather than a almost continuous curve like this fin can. I'm using one of these flat plastic squeegees that are a little bit bendy here to smooth out the epoxy because again, too much epoxy will actually reduce the strength of our layup instead of increasing it. So what you're looking for here is to have the material just slightly wet all the way around with no dry spots, but no excess. Then after that, we can finally start applying the layer. So I did my best to center it on the fin can and put it down. Now this first layer is super easy. It's like no trouble at all. What we're looking for here is an indication that every part of the epoxy is pressed against the surface. And this is a great reason to start by using fiberglass over something like carbon fiber because fiberglass you can really easily see through, especially once it's wet. So it's very easy to tell if the layer has delaminated against the surface that we're laying up on. Just like before with the epoxy fillets, we want no bubbles, but we like really, really want no bubbles. Bubbles will kill your flight. Bubbles will ruin your life. Bubbles will cavitate your turbo pumps and destroy them. Bubbles will buckle your COPVs on the launch pad, hashtag Amos 6. Bubbles will, will ruin the strength of your entire layup. So you wanna remove every bit of bubbles that you can. No bubbles. I spent a lot of time on each layer, very, very carefully removing any bubbles that I could see. Next up is layer two, which is at 45 degrees to the original weave direction. With this one, when I squeegee the material, I'm going with the weave direction and not at 45 degrees to it. So I'm going with the local weave direction. And the reason I do this is because when we pull against the weave direction, we maintain the shape very well. But when we pull non-orthogonal to the weave direction, the material can stretch out and change shape very easily, and that's gonna be hard to work with once we get it on the airframe or the fin can. This is where the layup starts to get a little bit more difficult though. You need to put layer two on top of layer one in the exact right position because you can't easily slide it around without messing with the layer one under it. You also need to go straight down on top and smooth it gently out without creating any bubbles on that layer and the layer below it. You'll notice how some of the 45 degree layers don't overlap with the layers below them and this isn't really intended Again, sort of evidence that I'm not an expert here. It's not terrible, it's not the worst thing in the world, especially since we have more layers than we needed, but I would probably cut that a little bit larger next time. You'll also notice that as the layup continues, we get quite a few bubbles around the layer overlaps. For the next layup, I'm gonna focus hard on keeping the edges of this weave clean. I mean, just in filming this video, you can see how easily this material comes apart. Frankly, working with materials like this is almost equal parts art as it is science. Continuing the process here is also pretty straightforward through the rest of the layers. There's a ton of very small adjustments and inspections as the layers go on one by one. As mentioned before, the last layer of 7.5 ounce glass overlaps all of the edges fully because we're going to sand it down later. We want full surface coverage on all those final layers, so that eighth layer of two ounce cloth is also cut this way. 
This isn't a structural layer as mentioned before, but is almost entirely cosmetic. The other thing with the two ounce layer is that when you sand into fiberglass cloth, you're starting to compromise the strength because you're cutting those fibers. I'd much rather sand into the non-structural two ounce fiberglass cloth on top to smooth things out, then I would sand into the A much rougher and B structurally integral uh, 7.5 ounce layer below. Finally, the last layer is the peel ply. As mentioned, the goal with the peel ply is to help smooth the surface just a little further and soak up a tiny extra bit of epoxy. We won't be vacuum bagging this setup, which is where you put a vacuum around the entire thing and then pull vacuum to get any bubbles out. There are tons of ways to do composites. This is just one approach that I have used, and I felt like vacuum bagging was a little too much for me to bite off on my first go around. I'll also mention that for eight total layers with a ninth layer of peel ply, a 60 minute cure time was absolutely perfect as I finished the whole thing with about six minutes on the clock pretty reliably. Just like with the fillets, epoxy cure times can vary greatly with the conditions that the epoxy is in. I decided that I couldn't afford that type of wait time in the layups that I was doing and the schedule I was trying to meet, so I tossed these fins into my terrible little cardboard easy bake oven with a meat thermometer. Once again, that accelerated the cure time from something like 24 to 48 hours down to one and a half or two hours. Once the layups cured on each layer, I removed the peel ply and sanded off the edges. I had to be super careful with this as it would be really easy to cut right into the actual fin around the edges and take a nick out of the airframe. And to be frank with you, I actually did this. I'll take a picture in a close up, but there's a little nick out of the airframe here in a spot where we just don't have a lot of layup and it's because I accidentally hit it with the belt sander. The finish with the peel ply alone was sufficient for me to skip sanding the surface down, but you could certainly do that here again because the two ounce layer is almost totally cosmetic. I am extremely happy with how this fin can came out. And again, also very happy that I made a backup fin can because I mean, worse comes to worse. I can also use this to fly on something else and I can use this to fly on something else. Although this one needs to be finished because we don't have any layups on these fins. The other thing we did is prior to launch, Charlie Garcia and I calculated the tip loading on the fins to see if we could do a static loading test to see if they would survive. Charlie assumed a pretty aggressive oscillating flight profile where we would see somewhere on the order of like 90 to 100 pounds on the tip as a point load in terms of the torque that each fin would see. I'm like 175 pounds, 180 if I eat a decent amount of fried rice, but figure if you split that down the middle and you just stand on the edge of the fin, that's pretty much a fin load test. Okay, so look. I'm like 90% sure this works. I'm like 60% sure this works. Ugh. I'm like 40% sure this works. Okay. Oh my God, that's my full body weight. That's it, has full body weight. This is so dangerous. <laughs> do not, do not do this. Oh gosh. I was super nervous to do this, but it went totally fine. The fins had a very small amount of flex, but were otherwise silent. By the way though, if you're gonna do one of these tests where you do fin loading, if you hear cracks, if you hear stress or strain sounds, that's a pretty bad sign because that's the sound of your epoxy bonds breaking. And every time that happens, the fins get less and less strong. So you're sort of doing a destructive test at that point. So if you hear sounds, you have a little cause for concern. In the next video, we'll talk about the recovery system for Lumineer. So that is the dual parachutes on board. We'll talk about why it failed. We'll sort of get into it. We'll talk about all of the times we tried to redesign it and uh, ultimately, you know, how it killed the flight. As it turns out, I mean, no surprise, but recovery is very hard to get right. So I'm looking forward to talking about that. Thanks as well to the patrons who support this ridiculous project. I haven't mentioned it in a while, but we've been doing little patron hangouts where we sort of shoot the breeze and that's been a lot of fun. If you're into that kind of thing, there's a link in the description below. And if you're not, no sweat at all. I'm really looking forward to talking about the recovery system and how it failed miserably. Uh, thanks again for watching. My name is Joe Barnard. May your skies be blue and your winds be low.